Hi everyone and welcome back to Advanced Heart Biology. Today we're continuing with Unit 1, Cells and Proteins, the fourth key area, Communication and Signaling, and we are nearly finished it. We're on to Part D, Nerve Impulse Transmission. Now, like I mentioned in my previous video, I'm annoyingly going to split this up into two parts. This is Part 1, Generation of a Nerve Impulse, where we look at essentially what a nerve impulse is and how it is created. And then Part 2 will be a bit shorter, and we look at more of a sort of case study of how this works in the eye. Um, the reason for this is it's quite lengthy, it's quite complicated, so it just breaks up uh, even more than we normally do with these key areas. So let's get started. First of all, with nerves, hopefully you remember from National 5 Biology about your sensory inter and motor neurons, and that we have electrical messages being transmitted along a neuron, and then those messages have to cr cross the synapse through chemical messengers called neurotransmitters uh, and that's really the most that we talked about. Um, if you did higher, but higher human biology, sorry, you will know a bit more detail about this. Um, it's not required for this so don't worry if you if you didn't uh, but what we're really going to be looking at is more applying our knowledge of advanced higher biology particularly in terms of membranes and how these electrical messages are actually generated. So uh, first of all, we're going to go through a few terms that we're going to discuss in this area, because like I said, it, it's quite lengthy. It's not really the most exciting to be perfectly honest, um, but we need to sort of learn some terms. Then we'll look at step by step how this electrical message is generated, and then we'll move on to the eye in the second video. So first of all, these nerve impulses, these are signals that are just transmitted along a nerve fiber, these electrical messages. Um, however, if you have a look here, it's important to remember that we have these membranes along this nerve and these different membrane proteins, of which there's going to be a constant flux of ions going back and forth. So again, looking at this through more the lens of advanced higher detail, it's not just electrical signal, how is that electrical signal actually generated? So first of all, you might remember the term resting membrane potential. Now, if you remember, this is a state where there is no net flow of ions across the membrane. So there's no net flow, this is just the resting uh, potential and any change in the flow of ions is then going to have an impact on that potential. So if we were to actually generate a nerve impulse, we're going to need a change in that membrane potential. So therefore we're going to need ions moving in, ions moving out, going to have some form of effect here. This diagram at the bottom, we will be coming to in a lot more detail. So don't worry if you're looking at this figure, what's going on here. Um, essentially this is looking at the changes in ion movement and what the effect is on what we call the action potential. Now, an action potential itself is just a wave of electrical excitation along that membrane. So again, the ions are going to move, and that's going to lead to a change in the membrane potential. That's going to lead to this wave of electrical excitation uh, called an action potential that's going to cause this signal. If you almost think about it like uh, looking at a heart rate monitor and the sort of beeps going up in the, these peaks and lows there, that's essentially what this looks like, this generation of electricity. Um, now, we're going to come across two words, depolarization and repolarization. It's important to know the difference between them and be able to spot them in these diagrams and such. So, first of all, if we look at this diagram here, you can see uh, what's labeled as part two. We have this part called depolarization, where the voltage is increasing and we're hitting this action potential. Now, depolarization is a sudden change in that membrane potential. Usually, it's going from a negative or a, a relatively slightly negative charge to a positive charge. Uh, you can see again on this graph down here that it, it is negative but not massively so and it's going to increase from negative to positive, have that peak and that would be depolarization. Um, when that happens that's going to be caused by the entry of positive ions. If you add in positive ions there's then going to be the opening of these voltage gated sodium channels so essentially we're looking back our sodium potassium pump. And if that triggers the opening of more of these channels, then there's going to be more depolarization. And the more depolarization takes place, the higher this action potential is going to get to. Ultimately though, we will get to a point where these sodium channels are going to close. They're going to be inactivated. What then happens is that leads again to the opening of these potassium channels, like we've talked about before, and we're going through a period of repolarization. And again, in this diagram here, you can see this action potential drops down, and we essentially head back to that resting membrane potential. So depolarization going up, repolarization, charge going down. 
just so you're aware of those because sometimes people get quite confused. Um, now, with the synapses, this part here is going to go through the, the process briefly and then we're going to sort of repeat it, but sort of chunk it up a bit nicer, but just so you know how this all essentially works. As I said, you mentioned synapses in National 5 Biology. All you really talked about was synapse are the gaps between neurons and neurotransmitters are little chemicals that move the messages between the synapses. Now, essentially that's all we need to remember for this part here. These neurotransmitters, again, they don't just sort of carry a magic message across the gap. What they're actually doing is they're moving across the synapse, they're uh, binding at the end of a synapse and they trigger the opening of these ligand gated ion channels. Uh, and those ion channels then go cause movement, which is going to lead to peaks of these depolarization and this act, um, this action potential moving throughout uh, the whole of this nerve. So essentially, this neurotransmitter is going to bind, it's going to open up these ion channels that are ligand gated. If there's, then going to be depolarization, but if there's enough depolarization, if there's a sufficient amount of ion movement um, and we go past what we call a threshold value, then there's going to be the opening of voltage gated ion channel, uh, sorry, sodium channels, and there's going to be more sodium ions entering the cell. Okay. Um, like I said, we'll go through this in the graph. Uh, think of threshold value almost as like the action potential, um, or sorry, the activation energy of an enzyme reaction. Uh, you need to hit that threshold value, you need to go beyond that in order for more depolarization to take place. If there's depolarization, but it doesn't hit that threshold value, then it doesn't trigger the opening of the rest of these voltage gated sodium channels. So we have that change in membrane potential. And then as we said, we have this depolarization, the charge goes up, but eventually after a short time, the sodium channels are going to become inactivated. And then these voltage gated potassium channels then open, potassium ions move out of the cell and we have this charge decreasing through repolarization and we restore resting membrane potential. Now, like I said, we're going to go through this just in a little bit more detail here. I think it's quite helpful to visualize it on the graph um, and also just so you know each part here. But that is essentially the whole um, the whole process. That's really all you need to be knowing about this. So again, just to look at this on the graph, if we have step one here, where we have the stimulus, we have the ions moving, and we need this, um, th this depolarization to hit the threshold before we have fuller depolarization and the movement of all these sodium channels. So you can see on the, the yellow lines down here, there's failed initiations. So that's essentially where there's been some ion movement, but not enough to hit the threshold value. Uh, and then what happens is we have this action potential being generated. If we look at step two, so this full depolarization going on, this is this rapid change in membrane potential. As I said, the sodium channels are now open. There's now loads of sodium ions going in, and we have this big increase in the positive charge of this action potential. In step three, we mentioned before, we then have repolarization because these sodium ions are now inactivated, they are closed, and now there's going to be this efflux or exit of potassium ions leaving the cell uh, from the activated potassium channels that are now open. And as you can see, the charge now decreases and we go down um, to our resting stage. Now, there is a period here at the bottom called hyperpolarization. Uh, this is basically where the membrane potential is lowered because there's been such a change, such an exit of those potassium ions and the potassium ion channels are now closed. But we get back to this resting state where the membrane potential returns to that, that resting voltage, that resting membrane potential. Okay, So we can see in all these parts here, we're then back at five. And then if there's more ion movement, then sodium channels are going to open up if they go past the threshold value, more depolarization, shutting of ion channels, opening of potassium channels, then repolarization, and this process just repeats itself. Now, another part to look at here, and this diagram tries to show this kind of movement along a neuron, but depolarization uh, of a patch of membrane then causes these neighboring regions of a membrane to also depolarize, and they go through the same cycle. So again, when we go back to this diagram here, I mentioned earlier thinking about a heart rate monitor and these, these bleeps, these, um, these peaks going up. That's essentially what's happening is once we have this action potential here and we get to the resting state, the neighboring patch of that membrane is then going to go through the same process as well. And that's just going to move, for example here, from left to right all the way through this nerve. 
Obviously, once we get to the end of a new run, though, we hit that synapse that we mentioned beforehand. So when that action potential finally reaches the end of the nerve, it's going to cause these vesicles which contain neurotransmitters. So remember these vesicles, these little, um, these objects are able to carry uh, these messages across. They're going to carry neurotransmitters um, to the membrane, then going to send them across to be released and stimulate a response in the next cell. So, and again, once we have that, you're going to have more depolarization taking place. We have the restoration of that resting membrane potential. You're going to have the inactive voltage gated sodium channels to go back to its normal conformation, which then means they can open up again if there's more depolarization to release more of those sodium ions, which then is going to lead to an inactivation, uh, depolarization, the repolarization, and opens up the potassium channels. So again, this just goes on and on, essentially. And just a reminder there as well, repolarization, is that these iron concentration gradients, they are re-established by the sodium potassium pump. So like I said before, this whole process is being generated by sodium and potassium moving in and out of these membranes. Uh, and this, this active transport of these is what's generating this electrical impulse the whole time around. Okay. Once we have that, again, you get back to your resting potential levels. So again, if you just remember your resting uh, membrane potential is just your your normal stage, there is no net movement of any of these uh, ions. But again, if there is then going to be a change, that's going to lead to your depolarization and eventual repolarization. So like I said, that's quite a complicated part. Hopefully it's explained a bit more of a way that'll help you out, but that is the last part of um, Kiria 4D part one. Uh, like I said, we will go on to a second video shortly where we're going to look at nerve impulses and responses to a stimulus in the eye, so therefore light signaling. Uh, and that'll be the last part of Kira 4, which means we only have Kira 5 left of Unit 1. Okay, so make sure you've watched part one first and you're comfortable with the terms depolarization, repolarization. Like I said, I think that graph is quite useful to go through and just make sure you know all the stages. Um, quite a useful one to know for, say, a four mark question, be able to label out the exact processes, what's happening, what's a threshold value, what channels are opening for depolarization or repolarization, and what's your membrane potential. So again, thanks so much for listening, folks. I uh, appreciate all the comments uh, coming across. I know people are um, concerned about how quickly videos are coming out. We are getting back into them, uh, and hopefully there'll be enough for you uh, to be revising for, say, upcoming assessments, prelims, that sort of thing. So again, thanks so much for listening, folks, and I will speak to you next for Nerve Impulses in response to environmental stimulus.